please welcome Chief Executive Officer, Intercontinental Hotels Group, Keith Barr, in discussion with Skift Hospitality Editor, Deanna Ting. Keith, for joining us. I know Thanks for letting me be here. from London, but um, we so appreciate you being here. Um, before we begin um, the session, I want to remind everyone that you're more than welcome to submit and upvote any questions you might have for Keith. We're going to try to answer them at the end of our conversation by using um, the event app or Slido and uh, the hashtag Skift Forum. Okay, so Keith, you're the CEO of Intercontinental Hotels Group. Your brands include Holiday Inn, Crown Plaza, Kimpton, Hotel Indigo, Avid, even Chris Nassetta knows what that is. Uh, and you became CEO this July, succeeding former CEO Richard Solomons. Um, but you've actually been with IHG for 17 years now? Uh, well, actually, yeah, pushing 20, in IHG for 17, around there for 25 years. Wow, OK, great. So. You've officially been CEO for about three months now. Uh, what's been the most surprising or unexpected thing about your new role? The amount of emails. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't think it was humanly possible to get as many emails in a day from some of you in this room, I think, actually, um, talking about how they can solve all of my challenges around data, UX, loyalty, technology, Corporate tax rates, I mean, literally, things I didn't even know I was supposed to be worried about, I get emails about on a daily basis. But um, all kidding aside, it was, you know, it was sort of just an inundation of in information coming from all, and how do you filter that out? And um, some of it's been great, though. I mean, I've been with the company for 25 years, worked in the US, Australia, China, globally, and, you know, getting emails from business partners, owners, and colleagues just support, you know, talking about it's great to have someone who's actually been a general manager running the company, someone who has worked in China and gets China in the role. So it's been, a, it's been an amazing experience and um, also with customers too. I was, you know, amazed at the time that people will take, not to complain because you do get those, but to share these incredibly touching stories about what happens in our hotels every single day. Um, clearly the hurricanes recently have been a tragic event and I was talking to our head of communications about one I got yesterday about the Holiday Inn Express in Clearwater, Florida. And this woman got displaced from their homes and talks about going into the hotel at 2 a.m. and the staff being there, all of whom were losing their homes and looking after people and looking after her dog who was 14 years old and eating special food and the staff were helping to prepare that. And you know, it's an amazing industry we operate in. And I think one of the, I think maybe Danny said it, you know, if you're in this business, you like taking care of people. You like being out there. And, um, you know, I see that every single day around the world. Right. And speaking of Danny Meyer, um, something you, you revealed to me backstage was that actually your very first job in hospitality was when you were 13 and you were a dishwasher. Yeah. But that you also studied to be a chef as well. Yeah. Um, and so you, you, could have been, you could have been the next Danny Meyer. Who knows? I know. Um, I know. <laughs> the, the, you the, ever... the path's not taken. I could, you know, do you ever think about that and, and whether or not you, you, you sort of wish or wish oh, you'd gosh. explored yeah. that path more? I mean, some people that know me, I'm a passionate foodie. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just love that aspect of the industry. And I get to dabble in it. I mentioned, um, you know, I get to, well, in my past jobs, I get to, you know, design a restaurant or two here or influence it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, though, if in this job, if I'm designing restaurants, I probably won't be in the job too long. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably not the highest and best use of my time. But, you know, I, I love this industry and I love, Food is such a, a vibrant, exciting part of what we do. And so, you know, we've got great brands like Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants. Right. And, you know, you see us opening up great design-led boutique hotels and killer restaurants and bars as well with their, to delivering that great experience too. So um, I'm staying over at the Eventi in, uh, mm -hmm. on 6th. That's right by your office. Right by your office. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go in, it's a, I mean, just the, the buzz that's in that hotel. I walked in yesterday at 1.30 in the afternoon wondering why aren't these people working? Because the, the bar is full, the restaurants are full, the lobby is full, you know, and that's what makes this industry so exciting. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so kind of back to your, your new role, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you want to do differently from Richard and what do you sort of want to keep the same? Uh, I'd like to have the share price move the same as it did under his tenure, because that was a pretty good move. Uh, you know, Richard and I have known each other for a long time and I was critical in setting the strategy and so, you know, 
our asset light strategy, which you've heard some of our other companies talk about, you know, we're done with that. You know, we have 5,200 hotels around the world open today, 1,500 in development. We own eight. I mean, so we're a brand company through and through, becoming more of a technology company every single day. And so it's really leaning into that of what does that mean going forward of how do you accelerate growth in a company of our scale uh, with the brands that we have and also the platforms that we have. And, you know, I was asked, I just finished doing a round the world trip. So I was in uh, Atlanta, then I went to Singapore, Shanghai, and met with our European team as well. And I've spoken to about 1,200 colleagues in town halls and talking about kind of where we're at as a company and opening up to questions and answers. And the first town hall, I was caught completely off guard. And somebody asked me a question, said, after a year of being chief executive, what will success look like? And I was like, well, I've been thinking a lot about what we need to do and where we're headed, but what would success look like? And, and many people would talk about, well, the share price is up X percent, or we've grown by so much. And I, and I, I said to the crowd, I said, let me give you a very personal answer. It's just going to be easier. I said, it's going to be easier to get things done, easier to deliver innovation into the market, easier for us to deliver new guest experiences, easier for us to deliver new technology into the business. And how do we as a team organize ourselves to be more entrepreneurial and move faster? Because we're in an industry that is moving faster and faster every single day. And so whilst we're all getting bigger, you actually have to be moved even faster as a big company today to compete effectively. Right. So technology has been a big buzzword throughout Huge. this conference. Um, you've had some other fellow hoteliers mention, you know, that they're testing out chatbots, they're testing out, you know, voice search. Um, they want to develop connected rooms uh, using the Internet of Things. What does I, how do you sort of see technology playing more of a role in the guest yeah. experience with IHG? I think of technology um, in, in, in two distinct ways. One is I think there's many things that we can do on technology that isn't transparent to the customer that drives value for owners, and that's around marketing tech. That's about revenue management, utilization of AI, and so forth. How do we price and merchandise and sell better? And that's critical for our industry moving forward, and we're doing a lot in that space. Customers won't directly see that. I think when you talk about customer-facing technology, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to solve for? Because you can do tech for tech and do lots of interesting things that add very little value to the customer journey. And my view is you have to look across the customer journey and saying, how can I use technology to remove friction? Whatever that friction may be, friction in terms of finding content, friction in terms of booking a guest room, friction in terms of checking out of a hotel, whatever it might be, that's what technology is really enabling to happen across a variety of industries of saying, what was once a kind of lumpy, difficult task, now because we've all got one of these things in our pocket, you know, we can do it much easier and faster. And so it's investing in technology. And candidly, I mean, we've looked at some things in the past and I said, oh, we should go do that because it was interesting. Then we really drilled down into it. It didn't have a big impact on customers. And so one thing we've just started doing this year is mobile checkout, for example. Mm -hmm. It's in 2,600 hotels. We're scaling it up. And I think we've had you know, not a lot, 250,000 checkouts so far. And I use it all the time now, because it's removed a friction point. You know, I can look at my phone, real-time folio review, going, see all my charges, click checkout, it emails off to my assistant, I don't have to worry about it. Didn't have to get a copy of my bill, didn't have to go to the front desk, didn't have to do anything, and so that's how I think you have to think about technology. Mm -hmm. Another thing people mentioned, too, was sort of personalization. So how far can the hotel experience actually be personalized right now? And where do you sort of see it going forward? You know, I think we'll continue to progress more and more. And so, you know, we, we've got an award-winning app. And it, we continue to put more and more personalization into that in terms of stay preferences and giving content to our colleagues as well, too. And so we've launched a number of tools where now, at the front desk, they know where you stayed most recently. Did you have a problem in that last day? Um, how did you book your reservation? Do you have any special requests? And we're building more and more functionality in there to enable our colleagues but you, to be able to engage with customers that way. But you have to automate more and more. I mean, again, we've got nearly 750,000 hotel rooms around the world operating right now and another 250,000 in development. That's a lot of people in a lot of hotels. And if you're relying upon them to try to do everything consistently, 
you're going to struggle with it. So you have to think about how can you use technology and automation to deliver a more personalized experience and make it easier for our colleagues in the hotel to do that. Great. Um, so going back to Richard, I know he spoke at our inaugural uh, yeah. Skift Forum Europe in, in April, right after the Brexit vote. Um, you know, it's been a few months since then, but when the vote initially came out, you know, IHG sort of stated that the company didn't foresee that huge of an impact on its business because of it. Um, I'm wondering, you know, a few months have passed now. Has there been an impact? Do you sort of foresee any other additional impacts that... With Brexit? Yeah, with Brexit or... You know, it's, I mean, uh, I live in the UK. I've uh, been there four and a half years. Couldn't, couldn't vote yet. Um, so, I mean, the British people made that decision. The, U the UK, it's 5% of our business. Europe is 14% of our business globally. So it doesn't have a material impact. I think the big question mark is what is the future of the relationship with the UK, with Europe, and how is that going to evolve? And there's a lot of uncertainty around that right now. Um, many of you saw in the papers over the weekend in the UK, you know, more and more uncertainty around what that structure of the relationship will look like. I think the great thing about being a global hotel company is we're in so many different markets that it sort of, you know, swings and roundabouts. Some markets are, you know, Middle East is really tough right now, mm -hmm. but we're actually having fantastic results in the UK. Um, candidly, the pound actually got devalued pretty materially post-breakfast, so it's a boom for travel to the UK right now because it's on sale. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it shapes up, but it doesn't have a material impact on IHD. Right, and as a, ho a global hotel company, I've been sort of interested, you know, there's been a lot of talk this year about travel bans, about restrictions, about uncertainty in travel. It's the theme of our <laughs> conference here um, today. I I'm just wondering, you know, how closely are you paying attention to what's happening on sort of like that geopolitical scale? And, you know, how concerned are you about this type of rhetoric that's being issued by our president, uh, you know, regarding travel bans and, you know, yeah. do you think that that maybe it won't have a material impact on the business, but how do you think that, what kind of an impact do you think it'll have on travel? It's not going to have a material impact on business. I don't think it's going to really have a material impact on travel. Um, I just don't think it's good to have any sort of conversations that are focused on restricting people from moving from country to country. I mean, travel is an, an inherent right. You know, and I was always amazed. I mean, think about after 9-11 and then the horrific events that took place, business travel did come off. I mean, we saw, all saw that in this industry. Leisure travel continued because people want to be able to go and see friends and family and have that time away. And so I think, you know, we want to encourage governments to be very, very thoughtful about that and encourage, you know, I've been privileged to live all over the world. And the more time you spend getting to know people in different parts of the world, the more you can appreciate the differences and the similarities, and really how being more connected is a good thing, and being more insular is, not, is a bad thing. Right. And so, you know, on a personal level, I always will encourage that. Right, and speaking of your international experience, uh, you were IHG's Greater China CEO for four years. Um, you know, during your tenure there, what was sort of the most surprising thing about that market, and why do you think it's historically so challenging for Western companies to just sort of get it, to, to be able to, to succeed in that market? Yeah, I mean, we've had phenomenal success in Greater China, as you know. It was 100 hotels when I went there, uh, and I built a strategy to grow our China business. It was 200 when I left. We just crossed over 300 hotels now and have another 250 development. Uh, I've launched our franchising platform for Holiday and Express. So I'm often asked advice from people who want to go to China, and, I, and they say, what should you do? And I said, start 30 years ago like we did. I mean... You know, we've been in that market since 1984, have deep relationships and understanding of how to go to market there, and, and also how to operate. You know, I often, you know, will talk about, I mean, that is a mobile first market. So you don't, shouldn't even be thinking about desktop, you know, and um, I see some of my team in the room, and, you know, we were building out lots of functionality originally. I'm like, oh, we got Google Maps. Well, that doesn't really help us in China. You know, you've got to be thinking Alipay, Union Pay, WeChat Pay, vertical integration into China. And so, you know, it's a market that, um, would I say we've completely cracked it? No, but we're doing better than everyone else. And, you know, we're seeing great revenue and profit growth out of there, but also just a deep understanding of the relationships of what it takes to work in China. And in some ways, China is way ahead of the rest of the world. What can the greater travel industry sort of learn from the, from? I mean, their focus on mobile and vertical integration is extraordinary. I mean, the way they think about the, I mean, it's, I mean, most of our, um, most of our revenue actually comes through mobile now, not through desktop. And 
they really think mobile first. People say it, they fundamentally just do it. Um, but also recognize as advanced China is, it still is a bit of an emerging market and there's some traditional ways of working there and so you have to reconcile how do you do both things simultaneously, um, which can be a bit of a challenge. It was the most amazing personal and professional experience I've ever had. Four and a half years and you know, moving from Sydney, Australia into Shanghai, China, a country of 25 million into a city of 25 million mm -hmm. and the pace at which it changes. Um, it's really hard to comprehend until you've been there. I mean, I was just back in Shanghai last week and things that were literally fields 18 months ago are now apartments, offices, retail, and parks, and just comes up, and that's how fast it moves. Things that take a decade in the West can take you know, 18 months in China. That's crazy. <laughs> so um, I know given your global perspective too, it was interesting that earlier uh, this summer, you also made some news by announcing sort of like a restructuring of the IHG organization. Um, you sort of placed the main office for Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, consolidated it and kind of placed it in Europe. What was your thinking behind that? Why, why bring all those sort of regions together under one office like that? Yeah, I, I made two big changes. Um, first, at a, at a group level, um, I've created a new chief marketing officer role focusing on brands, marketing, loyalty, and sites. Uh, and I also took the old, uh, our, our technology role and combined it with a significant portion of our commercial because our CAI and I would talk regularly, there's just a convergence between tech and commercial and treating them as two separate entities in this day and age is pretty archaic. Mm -hmm. And so brought that together. And then having worked in Asia and around the business, I saw real benefits. When we broke China out of Asia Pacific, China benefited and Asia benefited because it had the right focus on the markets. Mm -hmm. And so in the new structure we're building for the company, it's really a market focus versus a regional focus structure. Mm -hmm. How do you win in Australia? How do you win in Japan? How do you win in Southern Asia? India, Middle East, Germany, UK. Regions are company constructs. Mm -hmm. You know, we like, to, we like to organize things a certain way so we have a P&L that says something. Right. Reality is, you want to have the right good and market strategy, right resources in place, close to the coal face where things happen. And so that's how we're organizing. And it's, it's a bit contrarian, but you know, recognizing we want to really enable us to grow and outperform in those markets. Mm -hmm. So I want to switch gears and talk about the newest brand that you announced, Avid Hotels. Um, you know, it seems like everyone in the hotel industry is really focused on the mid-scale space especially. We saw that with Jeff earlier um, from Wyndham. But my thinking is, do we really need another <laughs> mid-scale hotel brand? Um, what makes this brand so different or, you know, well, prove me wrong. If the 14 million customers that we looked at in the segment that exists <laughs> Um, are right, mm -hmm. yes, we do. Um, you know, we really took a deep dive because we know mainstream. I mean, Holiday Inn Express, arguably the most successful mm -hmm. mid-scale brand in the industry after mid-scale Holiday Inn, we, we, we own that space. We then went out there and looked deeply into it and saying, at, at this price point, there was just deep dissatisfaction. So 10 to $15 below Holiday Inn Express, you know, we sized it, 14 million travelers in the U.S. alone, a $20 billion segment. And when you talk to customers, which we, we did the typical quant, we did the focus groups, we went to people's homes, and you just hear them talk about going, you know what, there's no quality, there's no consistency, they don't really understand my core needs, and that's where Avid came from. You know, a fresh approach to that segment, so it's a smaller guest room, impeccably designed though, you know, cutting edge in terms of noise cancellation, great HVAC, great in-room technology, grab-and-go breakfast, really efficient space. Um, and we already have 150 expressions of interest from owners to build in the US, and that number will accelerate pretty quickly, too. So owners are telling us they want the brand, and customers are telling us they want the brand. And so um, I think it will be our next big thing for IHG. Okay, great. So I know um, coming up next, we have Airbnb co-founder uh, Nate, um, Nathan Blacharsik, uh, coming up. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you now own Kimpton, which was sort of the original hotel disruptor. Today's disruptor is Airbnb for the hotel industry. Um, given the way travelers have really sort of embraced alternative accommodations, what do you think hotel companies like AHG can learn from a disruptor like Airbnb? And here's another question too, but I always hear from hotel CEOs, they always say, Chris said it earlier, Chris Nassetta from Hilton, you know, 
Airbnb is not really a threat. They, you know, they're different. They have different audiences, different uses. So if Airbnb isn't the threat, then what is the threat to the hotel industry? Sure. I mean, I, I think we've proven by now that it's, Airbnb is not an existential threat to the industry because the roles that hotels play in society, in development, in real estate, and so forth, and in corporate travel and leisure travel. So, um, But it is disingenuous to say that Airbnb has no effect on the hotel industry. Because that would basically be saying that in no time has anyone ever said, you know what, maybe I'll stay in an Airbnb versus a hotel. I mean, some people do that on certain needs and occasions. But it's on the margin for us. When you look at the geographic distribution of hotels um, versus Airbnb, the availability and so forth. So you know, it, it's clearly going to have some impact, but it's not an existential threat whatsoever. I think to your question of what do we learn, it goes back to, I think, the comment about friction. Homestays have been around as long as hotels. Actually, they probably were around before hotels existed. And hotel stay companies and homestay companies have been around a long time. What Airbnb has done, like other industries, is use technology to reduce friction in a transaction. It was pretty hard in the past to go find out in a good marketplace a variety of alternative accommodation. Airbnb did it. You know, think about what eBay did in the past, what Uber has done today. You know, so I mean, clearly that's what technology enables people to do, is having a much more effective marketplace and utilization of resources. And so we have to keep thinking about how do we use technology to remove friction across the customer journey and make it easier for the right customers to book with us the right way at the right time. And I think what the industry is always looking at is just having a level playing field, though. And you'll hear that time and time again yes, is, all the time. you know, we want regulation and we want taxation, because if you're going to be playing in that space, it should be a level playing field for us. But um, Competition makes us better, though, you know? And uh, we always will keep raising our game in the space. Great. So I want to see if we can take a question, some questions from the audience using Slido. I don't know if they, they said it would come in. So, great. Yeah, so kind of connected to that, are you planning to make any investments in the private accommodation space like Hyatt and Accor have done? You know, my general view is to try to buy businesses that make more money the bigger they get and not buy businesses that lose money the bigger they get. Um, it's generally a good rule of thumb uh, for an executive. So I think it's an interesting space. Buying into it, I mean, I can't say no in the future, but I wouldn't say it's top of our list of things when you've got such a core business that is strong in launching new brands, and we have more white space in our brand portfolio that can leverage our ex existing enterprise really well. You know, you, we could look at alliances in the future, though, and I think that's what you'll see more and more of as the like, industry matures. Like Hyatt and... Um, You're just going to see alliances Oasis. happen in, mm -hmm. in segments and geographies where hotel companies aren't competing today and there's somebody in that space mm -hmm. where it can be a win-win. You know, that it meets a customer need on both sides, uh, and that's where the next, I think, creative space will take place for the hotel industry. But it has to be enabled through technology, and that's where I think having, like, cutting-edge system like GRS that we're launching later this year and scaling up next year, you know, when you can redo your tech stack, not to be archaic, means you can partner a lot faster and more effectively, and that's what we've done for the last three years, and that's why I think we're going to have a bit of a competitive advantage in that space. Great. Well, thank you so much, Keith. It was great speaking with you. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.